Virginia Center for Politics. Hello, I'm Damon Hello, Irby, Dana. Director of Global Initiatives at the University of Virginia Center for Politics, and welcome to D Dangerous Discourse, part of the Center's Civility Project Series. Today, we have gathered a panel full of people with fascinating experiences, and each having either participated in or worked on a U.S. Department of State-sponsored international exchange hosted by the Center for Politics' Global Perspectives on Democracy program. We'll discuss their experiences on the impact of civility or incivility between people, citizens in government, or political factions. We'll be joined by UVA students and a colleague who will ask questions of the panelists, but due to co time constraints, we won't be able to take additional questions from the audience. My apologies for that. We hope to record one-on-one -on -one conversations afterwards with the panelists to delve further into their experiences. So please email me your questions at irby at virginia.edu. And uh, great, well, all right, well, let's get started with our introductions. I'm gonna start with Rami Aman. Rami Fr Aman from Gaza is a Palestinian peace activist who in 2010 founded the Gaza Youth Committee an organization focused on building person-to-person -person dialogue between Palestinians and Israelis. Mr. Aman in 2019 was taken into custody for 17 days by Hamas following his organizing of the Ride for Peace, which recruited Israelis and Palestinians to cycle in unison on each side of the border. Rami began a series of online engagements called Skype with Your Enemy in 2016 with a similar purpose of connecting citizens on both sides of the Palestinian-Israeli divide. The April 2020 event led to six months of imprisonment by Hamas and a conviction in military court of, quote, weakening revolutionary spirit. Rami Aman participated in the 2017 Leaders for Democracy Fellowship in partnership with World Learning. Joseph Mariampile, a UVA alumnus, is a seasoned humanitarian and international development professional with more than 15 years of experience in inclusive and sustainable dialogue on national and regional governance, peace building and economic development and other topics. Joseph, originally from Sri Lanka, currently serves in leadership positions at peace building organizations. His efforts to stabilize and improve the circumstances of minority groups are especially notable. And the recent military takeover in Myanmar has only increased the urgency and importance of his work. He has extensive international experience in South and Southeast Asia and a long history of work in politically sensitive areas like Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Northern Cyprus, and Bangladesh. Polina Polukina, at 16 years of age, was selected among hundreds of candidates to serve as a delegate of the 2016 Youth Leadership Program for Belarus in partnership with World Learning. The exchange, which focused on enhancing the civic engagement and social entrepreneurship skills of the participants, provided Paulina a springboard for her interest in civic engagement and business administration. She has studied at the Belarusian State University and recently earned a degree in business administration from the County College of Morris in New Jersey. Ms. Polokina cares deeply for the challenges faced by her fellow citizens and the importance of youth engagement and civic participation. Washma Abdul Rahimzai was selected in the 2011 um, U.S. Afghanistan Professional Leadership Program in partnership with World Le with Relief International. Washma has 15 years of leadership and management experience in both public and nonprofit organizations, including 15 years or five years as the Human Rights Officer at Open Society Foundation Afghanistan. While there, she led the women's rights portfolio focused on education and anti-sexual harassment advocacy projects. She's currently the vice chair of the York University School of Public Policy and Administration Alumni Network and a core member of the Women's Regional Network. 
Wajma obtained a master's degree in public policy, administration, and law, and a bachelor's degree in international development studies at York University in Toronto, and a bachelor's degree in literature and language from Kabul University in Afghanistan. Well, let's go, let's move now straight to Wajma. Wajma, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, would you like to make a brief comment before we get started on our questions? Oh, you might turn on your audio. It's cold of the ear, mute. So, yeah, thanks a lot for having us today in such a great discourse. Um, I'm super glad uh, coming back to uh, people, the group that I met long ago, and then we had a, such a great time, and then coming back to uh, discuss this very important issue. Um, it's, it has been a long time. It has been uh, 10 years. And this 10 years, uh, when I attended that program, uh, I was just a human rights officer and my vision, my goal was totally different. But now I am an immigrant in Canada. So there's so many things has changed and there's so many things uh, expanded to my experience that I see things differently. So I will be very happy to start from where you want me to start. Well, thank you, Washma. And can you believe it's been 10 years? It is hard to believe. But <laughs> let's, uh, if you don't mind, let's start with, uh, with your time in Afghanistan and particularly during the time uh, of when you were at the exchange, can you tell us about the work you were doing as the human rights officer uh, to help bring Afghan women out of the shadows from the Taliban period? Yeah, um, it's back 10 years ago from 2011 when I start work with the Open Society Foundation. Um, prior to that, I was working in Women and Children Legal Research Foundation, uh, which was also focused on women's rights. But particularly uh, from 2011, uh, I was leading a women's rights portfolio in general human rights, but particularly women's rights. And it has two uh, sections, women's rights uh, in uh, in supporting or improvement of women in political rights and economic rights, and then also transitional justice to provide a space for people who, who have voice for um, encounter those who were criminal in civil war and they should be accountable for. So it was true, a very huge um, and very uh, sensitive uh, programs that I was leading. Uh, in women's rights uh, portfolio, we were focusing, as I said, it was political, promoting women and political rights and economic rights, especially those days were uh, the days that everybody was talking about peace reconciliation with Taliban. Uh, when the Taliban uh, left country like left the government and the regime was in 2002 and from 2004 to 2011 there was a huge time and a space that women had the chance to uh, promote it women ha had chance to have access to education have access to social life but political rights was something or way back forward to gain their rights and meaningful rights to have participation in social and political discussion and political decision makings. So our objective was to promote women to have meaningful representation and participation in this reconciliation and peace process with Taliban. And then women's uh, efforts throughout past 10 years and their uh, sacrifices should not be ignored during this reconciliation. Uh, we also were uh, 
focused on that time and or another object is where how women should have their rights and their participation in decision making and through having positions at the leadership level of government. Uh, I believe um, those goals were, uh, were very sensitive for women to start working in that path. But the motivation and the hope was a lot. And the way civil society was working in this regard was very huge and very productive. Uh, I believe in terms of uh, participation, meaningful representation and participation of women in the peace and reconciliation was something uh, we made throughout this ten, uh, next 10 years to be participated, to be part of peace building, to be part of peace process. But the word meaningful, the word uh, measurable was a, a still missing. It was missing and still missing. And it's still women uh, got the chance to be part of that process. Imagine women who were hiding from the social spheres, uh, women who were at home, women who were who didn't have a rights to be to 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 have access to education to have in, have a proper social life uh, now they are in same table with those people that's a huge success that's a huge progress uh, to talk about a uh, peace process to discuss uh, especially when we come to the civility discourse they are part of the civility discourse, but they are not leading it. They are not, their participation couldn't be a meaningful participation because uh, I, will, I will talk about this maybe later in your next question that how, how situation women feel right now. Uh, these two things were our aim and my uh, portfolio focused on these two is but later, after in 2013, um, I started another um, portfolio, which is more sensitive in that time and is still sensitive regarding women access, uh, women sexual harassment, uh, which would be your next question that how I get to that path as well. So I will respond later. Uh, thank you, Washma. You know, I'm curious, um, recently, especially in the past year or so, there has been a, a, great, a great desire among uh, politi uh, inner world powers to find a lasting peace or stability in Afghanistan with ongoing uh, negotiations with the Taliban. And I'm curious, are you concerned that the gains that women have made in the last period could be, could be eroded? That's, that's a huge concern, not for me, for, for most of the women back, back home, most of women in Afghanistan who made a lot of efforts, who, who did a lot of sacrifices. Uh, the concern is that when we talk about stability, peace with the stability, the first thing uh, is important to uh, be considered as human rights. But unfortunately, these talks, these discussion among politicians are always missing the part of women rights, missing the part of how women will have their space in political and leaderships uh, or in the government of Afghanistan. Not in that level, not just on that level, but also when the peace happened, when they get to the, the agreement, how women will feel safe and secure that their work, their social work, their, um, their, um, their social life is not, not uh, will be um, filtered with that. So for example, uh, recently there's a research has been done and 85% uh, of women, they, were scared of the same life what they will have if the agreement happened, if the agreement 
will take place between government and the, the Taliban. Uh, it's because there's so many discussion behind the door. There's so many um, agreements that women are not really matters on those discussions. Like late, like recently, um, uh, for the second, like the first concept of the discussion was there was no women rights. There wasn't any aspect of women rights, in, especially in terms of uh, their participation and their uh, representation in the government. But the second concept, the second uh, concept come up like with more to that, that we will follow the constitution, which women's rights are uh, granted there. But it's very huge. It, decisions are very vague. It's not saying anything particular that how women have their rights and how they will have their freedom the same way they have right now. Um, there's so many uh, concerns. So it's, it's something like not very much clear yet. And that makes people and women kind of very worried. Thank you, Washima. Um, I, we're kind of, our time is quickly running away with us, but I have a student who would like to ask a question of us. It's uh, Miranda Hertz. Miranda, could you join us and ask your question? Hi, thank you so much for coming today. Um, my question is, now that you've relocated to Canada, um, how have you drawn on your experiences in Afghanistan to promote women's empowerment in Canada and elsewhere? Uh, I believe when, when I, when I uh, reached to Canada, I found that, oh, this is a great country. This is, uh, the society is so open for women rights. But when you go a bit a little bit deeper, you can find that women's rights and gender, especially gender equality, is uh, somehow missing in everywhere to some extent. Some of the areas like a country like Afghanistan is huge inequality. But in Canada, I see a little bit inequality, especially gender, uh, overall gender equality in terms of uh, workplace, in the workplace spheres. And, and um, like COVID recently uh, had the most women than men in terms of having access to job and employment. So it's it has to be the women and gender um, inequality is like somehow it's, it's, it's a part of our, our society, it's part of our um, community, uh, but it, it's different. It's in, in different uh, society, you can see differently. And also as an immigrant woman, you can face it also differently. Well, Washma, I thank you so much for your insights. Again, I wish we could spend uh, an hour together, and maybe we can with a, a, an yeah. interview later on that we can share with others. But thank you so much for, for being with us. I'd now like to go to uh, Paulina Polikina. Paulina, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, you are our youngest panelist, so congratulations. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in your thoughts on the importance of youth to a movement. Can you tell us the role that uh, youth have played in attempts to encourage openness and civility between the government and, and the people in Belarus? Sure, thank you very much for giving me the platform to speak up on the important topic that concerns me as a citizen of Belarus. Uh, being a um, in my 20s, I realized that the power of young people is some kind of a different energy that can motivate the whole civic movement to strive for the better. Uh, you know, Belarus has just started finding the way to get away from the dictatorship that has uh, occupied our country for over 25 years now. So being an activist in a country where a gathering of more than 10 or 25 people can has been always seemed suspicious is very challenging. I can uh, compare uh, the activism movement in Belarus as an invisible power. You, can, you can't see it, but you can always feel it. 
uh, thousands of young Belarusian people um, has always been proven that uh, our modern country is ready to uh, to be connected not only with the business and corporate world, but also with the government to ensure that future generations will be able to live and uh, to improve our country. Uh, passionate young w uh, people uh, are represented in every sphere of life, in art, music, science, and they are creating new platforms for it. But unfortunately, uh, because of the nature of the system that is currently in Belarus, they are not ready for the dialogue. They are more, um, they're more about authoritarian regime. So they're not ready for the, any kind of cooperation. But now the people are not ready to let the history re repeat itself. We are not ready to get back to the post-Soviet Union times. And many of my close friends together with already famous faces of Belarusian protests like Maria Kolesnikova, Viktor Babarika, uh, Sergei and Svetlana Tikhanovska are now not afraid to sacrifice the freedom if an attempt to build a dialogue can result in arrest. Every day campaigns either on the streets or online who are mostly led by young people in the age of 18 to 25, uh, even with the threat of imprisonment, do not stop people from speaking up and develop democracy. Thank you. I, ha I actually have a student uh, who has a question that's similar to, to uh, your, your opening comments. Struther, check. Struther, could you join us and, uh, and give your question? Hi, Polina. Thank you for joining us today. So um, my question has to do with the civil discourse in Belarus and specifically how do the people of Belarus, especially youth, um, feel about their opportunity to speak out publicly and socially on political concerns? Um, and what are those who are willing to speak out doing to let their voices be heard? Thank you very much for your question. Um, you know, as Martin Luther King Jr. once said that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. So, um, now, the most revolutionary success that 2020 Belarusian protests become so popular is because the new wave of young people joined the civic movement uh, and helped creating new ways of fighting for free Belarus. I'm talking about the widespread of social media, which is here is a big advantage for us. Uh, with the help of uh, different Telegram channels, YouTube videos, uh, Facebook or Instagram posts with hashtags, uh, those social media channels also become the platform where, where the truthful information is shared, where people can show solidarity, where people can uh, bring attention to the most important things. For example, because of the huge attention, because of the huge um, involvement in the social media um, movement, uh, the International Hockey Federation uh, canceled that world championship in Belarus that was planned uh, because they saw that uh, the specific concerns from the youth that fooled the comments, uh, fooled the social media uh, channels with the questions, with the uh, with a desire to said that it is not a safe place for citizens. So don't let people come into Belarus help us to get away from uh, the, the threats that surround us every single day right now. So yes, I believe that with the help, not, with, not only with the help of being physically present on the streets with being, you know, creating some kind of symbols in art, as I previously mentioned, in uh, science projects and different small initiatives, even uh, in your small community, young people are trying to uh, give a specific attention uh, for the international community to help um, overcome the challenges that are that we as Belarusians facing right now. Thank you, Paulina and Struther. Um, I'd like to um, hear a little more about uh, the citizens in Belarus. So what would, uh, what would you characterize as the 
most significant issue facing um, people in Belarus today? Sure. I think that uh, what I can call as the main concern of Belarusians is the complete uh, default of the whole legal system as what we're facing right now. Um, because of the nature of dictatorship and what um, uh, our president Alexander Lukashenko, who established himself and re-elected himself once again back in August 2020. Um, now, the, um, the, he and his representatives who are, are near him, are n they're, they're enjoying of having the privilege of having no responsibility of their actions. So they're creating their rules and their um, the new norms that everybody should now follow. Uh, so citizens are, don't have any platform where they can legally be protected. Not, I'm not talking even physically. So the horrors that are happening in the prisons right now um, are, are, are just horrible and uh, uh, sad. So I would say that um, people right now do not have fundamental fundamental basic human rights. There are no protection for physical abuse or legal representation from unlawful search or arrests. And at the same time, so those who are in the above all this, who manage all these horrors, are no are not being accountable and um, have never admitted doing anything wrong or feeling guilty for what they have already done. So I would call this a huge mix of uh, violation of the human rights as the complete default of the legal system in Belarus. So a, a breakdown of civility between government and the people. Yeah. Uh, I have a question that is a little bit lighter. Um, it's about you and uh, your academic and extracurricular background. You focus largely on business administration and civic engagement or social entrepreneurship. And I'm curious if you've thought about uh, your plans for the future in that regard. And also, I think I recall last time we spoke that you were in search of, of employment, that you have a little about a year to uh, work in the United States. So I'm curious uh, how that is going. Uh, so thank to um, wonderful youth leadership program 2016 that I took part. Uh, I think it was the year when I decided that I really wanted to study business administration and back there um, as a part of our admissionary um tasks we were we we needed to create a project social entrepreneurship project and one of my ideas was to create a, a company named travel and solve so it's basically combining two interests when you can travel with your friends but almost not only to see beautiful sites of the city that you want to uh, uh, visit, but also to connect with their communities and find out the way that you can uh, help. So uh, I was under the age of 18 that time, and I didn't realize that we had some kind of restrictions on traveling and funding. So uh, we were able to um, realize some of my ideas locally as a part of um, UNESCO Club Gulfstream. Uh, we volunteered uh, and uh, traveled throughout our city, Minsk. Um, and uh, hopefully for the future, I will be able to create um, this business or uh, any kind of dance relating business. And I will be deeply concerned about the corporate responsibility that the, uh, every company should be really thinking about right now. So everybody needs to think deeply about what they can give rather than only to take. Um, 
Yes, I'm currently in search of a, a position somewhere in the corporate world uh, or inter internship. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm still I'm still in the process. <laughs> Fingers <All right>. crossed. <laughs> thank thank you, Polina. So if you're out there, folks, and you think you might have a great position for Polina, you can email me at herbie <laughs> yeah. at virginia.edu, and I will connect you. I think she's willing to relocate. So thank you, <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Polina. I really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you for the platform. You bet. Uh, so now we'll we'll move to Joseph Mariampile. Uh, Joseph, thank you so much for being with us all the way from Myanmar. Uh, so Joseph, uh, we'll go ahead and begin. Well, you come to us today representing um, both uh, Sri Lanka and Myanmar, and um, but I, I'd like to to start with Sri Lanka, if that's okay. I know you and your family experienced uh, some major hardships related to the conflict there uh, when you were growing up. Can you tell us about the state of di civil discourse, uh, particularly among ethnic groups during your youth, uh, how it evolved during your professional career and uh, where you view civility today in the country? Thanks, Damon. Good to be good to be on the show with you, and and, and congratulations for the for the Center for Politics' is successful uh, global perspective democracy. And I think I had a pleasure to to be the first to to involve in that 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 process. So uh, good, and it's always good to see you. Um, yeah, I think the the my life started in Sri Lanka, and it, it started badly. You know, when when I was. Uh, Born, the, the conflict is there, there, the armed conflict is there, and the, the civil discourse about is about violence. And uh, you know, you see, and um, um, I belong to a an ethnic minorities. You know, it, it's, it was started at a peaceful, then it's emerged into a, an, an, a thirty-year bloody armed conflict. So, all my childhood youth is all about uh, um, conflict, violence, mistrust, hits, and dividing line, and and that's what I've seen. So it's all. Uh, um, shaped who I am now, you know, it, it's when you see, you know, too much uh, destruction and death surrounds you and that, that has an influence on you. And, uh, you know, conflict is natural. We're all human beings and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's natural that we disagree each other. But violence is optional. So you can prevent violence. So that, that's really um, made me who I am. You know, it, 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 it built me a sense of empathy um, so that, uh, uh, you know, stayed with me in, until my, you know, uh, professional life, uh, wherever I go. And uh, so having an, a, an, a sense of empathy. And uh, so it's very important. You, you can be very sympathetic to any issues, but um, that you won't be accountable if you are just be a sympathetic. So come on, empathy makes you uh, much more connected to, to everything you do. And, and that gives you a sense of accountability and, and holding yourself um, to the commit to the mission. So, yeah, it started with uh, discourse all about uh, violence and and then become empathy. It's about uh, you know how you uphold your principles and and work for a mission. Well, it, it's truly amazing uh, where you've been and where you are and uh, where you're going. So I commend you for for all your uh, successes. I'd like to move to uh, Myanmar now. So the, the news of the military taking over power from the nascent democratic government uh, there jolted people around the world. And uh, we've seen uh, violence in the streets between the military and the protesters. How do you think um, the protests will ultimately impact the current rulers? and? Can civil discourse, including nonviolent demonstrations, impact the decisions of those in power? I mean, the, largely the, the demonstration so far, it's been a, it's, it's a nonviolent demonstration. It's, it's a peaceful demonstration. So it's, it's already there in, in that forum. So that, that's, that forces the challenges for the, for the rulers because uh, they probably need an expected uh, large amount of uh, young people, you know, um, previous speaker so Paulina spoke very passionately about uh, um, the young people's effort on democratic uh, uh, rights and civic engagement. So that's what we see in, 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 in Myanmar, on the street of Myanmar, very young people up there and, and, and asking for a freedom and liberty. Um, so that nonviolent efforts and, and a large amount of effort has really 
uh, posed a challenge uh, for for the for the current rulers. I mean, this is not the first time the military has. Uh, taken over the power, power and this is the third time in Myanmar history and uh, and they are very often um, uh, know how to do this and uh, but this time it has brought an uh, extraordinary challenge for them uh, one is about this um, uh, non violent uh, demonstration by the young people uh, and two it's about uh, civil disobedience that been launched by largely the workers sectors from the state and private sectors who who are uh, uh, um, showing disobedience to to anything, so that that makes the country a bit ungovernable, and um, so that's all uh, you know, posing them as a, as a new challenge, and uh, and uh, the the reiterating this nonviolent itself is it's a posing new challenge because when you uh, when you exercise anything nonviolently, it's very hard to uh, um, justify a violent response. Um, so that's what uh, in happening in Myanmar. Thank you. Uh, I now have a student with a question. Uh, Shankar Radhakrishnan, could you join us and, and give Joseph your question? Yeah, hi there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so much of your work in Myanmar has focused on improving the situation for minorities, especially the uh, Rohingya population. Um, how have recent developments impacted minority groups in Myanmar? Sure. Thank, thanks for the question. I, I like your room. It reminds me of my 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 time in school um, with, with all the flags. Um, I think it, as I said from the beginning, you know, I I I came from minority background, and and you know, I come from a very suppressed community. So um, this is what uh, you know I learned to be um, to be adapted to the environment. So in in Myanmar, uh, you know, one one of my um, tasks or, or my number one priority is to make sure that the minorities. Uh, um, does not go through what I went through. You know, um, as I said, um, conflict is natural, but violence is not. Violence is optional. So there are there are ways to express their grievances, and uh, there is a way to uh, reduce the suffering. You know? So in Myanmar has one of the longest uh, civil war in the world. It's almost 70 years, and uh, there are multiple ethnic groups of fighting, and uh, so 70 years of war has brought enormous. Uh, Suffering and, and pain in not only the, uh, the the Rohingya minorities who are uh, been considered as a stateless, but the other minorities. Um, so the work in in in, uh, in for me it's it's sort of a multiple works. And so I work as a, a humanitarian development professional, a person that uh, you know deliver humanitarian aid, saving lives, um, sustaining livelihood. So it's all about working with the internal displaced people. The returnees, you know, who are it's in, 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 in impacted by uh, whether on con- ongoing armed conflict or natural disaster. Um, so, second is all about as a, as a, a fellow minority person who has gone through a, a cycle of, cycle of violence and 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 work for the peace. Um, so, Myanmar is actually going through a peace uh, peace process as well to to make sure that you know any peace peace in Myanmar is an inclusive peace. Uh, everybody has a say in the process. It's, it's not doesn't become a a process that's been driven by the elites. So there is uh, enough opportunity for every single person, particularly those who marginalize, uh, find a space and voice for them to uh, be involved in a, in, a, in, a, in a peace process. The third is, you know, sharing my own experience. You know, there are there are mistakes that I have seen. I made as a minority. There are mistakes I have seen. The minorities have made in other, other parts of the world and, and, and share that with the, my family follow minorities so they don't need to really um, you know make a mistake and most importantly le- you know listen learn there are plenty of uh, examples how how the minorities able to live with majorities whether minority able to um, uh, you know have living in a protracted conflict um, the issue of the, the rohingyas uh, it, it's a bit of a unique in myanmar um, i it was uh, my first exposure uh, to myanmar was about the rohingya issue so I was there during the, the cycle of violence, um, both in 2012-14 and then leading up to the 2016 uh, in a mass exodus. So uh, it was a sad part of in, in, in my history too, because uh, when uh, I went to Myanmar first time in 2008-10, uh, there was Rohingyas, but you know they were stateless, but rather they were you know living slightly in poverty condition, but they're okay. Um, whereas like you know the, the violent uh, during my time they 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 have faced uh, very violent uh, um, communal uh, rights and followed by uh, you know, uh, uh, counterinsurgency. So it was a very saddening to see um, uh, um, a huge amount of population, nearly to a million, 
people been uh, uh, called as stateless and uh, and uh, living in a very horrible condition and uh, in terms of their you know malnutrition and health condition is in a, in a very poor and living in one of the poorest part of uh, part of Myanmar um, so this is uh, an ex- you know, these are my experience particularly working on on both ethnic minorities and rohingyas Thank you. Thank you both. So Joseph, you have spent your career bringing divergent people together. And I'm curious, why do you why do you believe civility is important to developing peaceful and just societies and brave? <laughs> I mean, and I, again, I just, just go back to what I said previously, like, you know, conflict is natural. I mean, we are humans. We have a we, we all disagree. Uh, on many things, or we agree on many things. So, but violence is not is optional. You know, we we can we can choose different paths to um, to um, find common grounds. You know, we can we can agree to disagree and, and still move on. So, uh, for me, why uh, you know I, I took about bringing people, particularly people in the dividing lines, and, and whether it's dividing in, in vertical or horizontal, it's that's the only option. You know, there's uh, if you don't talk, you just fight. Um, so uh, a dialogue does not mean that you have to legitimize uh, by talking to uh, to your adversaries. You know, you can still be disagree, and you can still um, um, does not agree. You know, does not need to be in the same same uh, uh, you know be, being in the same uh, same room. But you know, talking is an important. So um, you you probably by by dialogue you you will be able to find a common ground. So that common ground. Will uh, will make you to uh, you know build trust. The trust allows you to find a solution. So therefore, uh, particularly those who are in the dividing lines, you know, I, I you know do share my experience. I do find common grounds with them. So that common grounds allows me to work with them, allows me to build trust with them, and and they themselves probably have much more common ground than than uh, that I have with them. Uh, so so my. Uh, you know, my role is about uh, facilitating a dialogue. It could be anything, uh, but it's them who will who will find a solution. They will decide how to move forward, or they might decide maybe they shouldn't be you know uh, having a dialogue anymore. So all about is to to help them uh, to to have a dialogue and uh, help them to find common common ground. It does not mean that they they have to come in a 50-50, uh, and then let let them to take that initiative forward. So that. Uh, as I said, you know, the empathy is. In order to do that, you need to have an empathy. You, you, unless you can't connect uh, yourself with the with the context, or the people, or the situation, it'll be very very hard for an outsider to um, you know bring people together. Because you know, it, it's it's uh, even though you might have all the good intentions, but it, you know, sometimes it's very hard. And I've been in Myanmar and I've been following Myanmar about like one third of my life, and uh, I'm still learning every day. So the the recent challenge is a new challenge. You know, the, we have the very young people who are on the street that nobody expected. Um, you know, some are 14, 18. Um, so this this is this is all um, uh, all about you know uh, having uh, understanding the the context of the country, having connected to the issues, and having an empathy and empathy and, and able to react in, in a based on empathy. I mean, you might have an empathy and not doing anything. But having empathy and, and connect and, and make them into results and have that audacity is very important. So that's that's make me to people bring together. Well, Joseph, uh, thank you so much. Thanks for all you do in Myanmar, and uh, please do be safe. And I I do want to recognize Joseph brought our very first um, global perspectives on democracy exchange opportunity to us back in two thousand nine with the Sri Lanka professional. Uh, exchange. So thank you, Joseph, and um, really appreciate you. So nice, let's, uh, you. yeah, you bet. Thanks. Uh, let's move now to Rami Aman. Rami, Rami is coming to us today straight from Gaza. I really appreciate you being with us. So Rami, you've, you've basically dedicated to your, uh, your life to increasing civil discourse between Palestinians and Israelis. Do you find that there is a is great desire for friendly relations among people, both uh, Gazan and Israeli? Uh, first of all, let me thank you so much for this invitation to join you and all colleagues in this meeting. And uh, really, I'm very proud to, to join Center for Politics and University of Virginia because I have a very good memory in, in my life uh, because I have uh, I had a fellowship 
uh, how to buy world learning, uh, UBA, uh, US Department of the State, uh, this kind of experience maybe give to me more support to continue my desire inside myself. Uh, and uh, as a Gazan walking in the streets every day and uh, listening from the people and uh, meeting different sectors, Yes, the pe- most of the people here in Gaza, uh, they are interested to, 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 to see peace and work for peace and dream for peace, not just with the Israelis, but with, with all over the people. It's not because of their nationality. Because the Gazans here are already missing their humanity. You know, since years and years, we, we just have blockade, siege, occupation, internal conflict. So nothing. So the people here, yeah. They need, they need the peace. And, uh, when you are listening their words and uh, talking to them, this kind of uh, of atmosphere of what's happening in Gaza gave to you more courage to continue your way and, uh, to do what you are thinking about. So, Rami, um, through through the Gaza Youth Committee, you came up with two particularly innovative uh, event ideas. One, the Ride for Peace, and the other, uh, Skype with Your Enemy. I know there are probably many other ones, but these are the ones that really come to mind. They're so novel. So what, what yeah. led you to them, and how was the response of the people who were who – were, um, you know, open to more friendly relationships with each other? Yeah, first of all, I'm a founder of a group include more than 150 guys from different categories. Every time we have our meetings, our ideas, our initiatives, uh, thinking about the future. And the same time, we have a very good network, you know, outside of Gaza, in Israel, in, in, in Europe, in America, created by, you know, years and years. Uh, Bike ride marathon, you know, it was just an idea to, to, to organize a bike ride for Gazans here, for Gazans kids. We have a lot of kids here in Gaza just need some chances, you know, to promote their concerns, to, to, to let the kids here thinking about how we can find a hobby for ourselves. The Gazan kids here all the time watching conflict in the news, suffering from the situation, no work for their fathers, no hope, you know. But if you enter some sport and some love and some fun inside their lives, I think maybe you can create a new generation. So we have a friend, you know, also outside of Gaza told us that why we can't, you know, make in the same time a bike ride in, in the border with Gaza, supporting your rights. And for me, it was an amazing, you know, an idea. And uh, after some few weeks, we designed the same logo, the same T-shirts. <laughs> And uh, it was an initiative for 50 Gazans here and more than 150 Israelis, you know, from different categories, sharing the same day, not to send any kind of political message, talk about one state or two states, no, just to talk that we understand our rights, that I respect you as a person. And then let's talk about the political cases. After some few days, you know, a huge campaign happened through our Palestinian social media that I'm doing normalization and uh, some kind of political agenda. And some people in Ramallah promoted that I'm working with Hamas and some people in Gaza promoted that I'm working with Ramallah. You know, it's like of our complicated situation as a Palestinian. Here. And then I found myself in the jail, arrested for 19 days. Uh, and then they release on me. Uh, but until now, I'm so proud you know, to, to, to be a one part. I'm just a small part in this idea. It was Manar, it was Aaron, it was Ronnie, it was Julia. I don't want to, to, to forget to know anyone. Just share the one idea. Not if I'm a Palestinian or if she is an Israeli. No, it's not like that. We just give the chance to people to talk with each other. The sky with your enemy, it's another, another story. You know? it, uh, uh, it was an idea came from Ruth Christina Basileva. She's uh, the first Israeli I met in Riyadh when I was in Jerusalem uh, to join a workshop talking about, I think, negotiation. I told her my idea that uh, I'm thinking to create 
a network includes Israelis and Palestinians, not just to have some fun initiatives, you know, talk some good words. No, to create a new generation can create new leaders, can create a new decision maker for the future. And we need just open sessions between the people. And let's work up, let's work away from them. And let's start from ourselves. I will introduce you for my family and you will introduce me for your family. And step by step, we can introduce each of us, you know, for our friends. And then we can get bigger and bigger. So we decided that she told me her idea that uh, it's a Skype with your enemy initiative to invite Israelis and Palestinians. And this kind of case, it's like of taboo subject in, 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 in Gaza. <laughs> if you are talking about Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, although that we have a lot of Palestinians here from Gaza importing and exporting the products with the Israeli side, uh, Gazan workers also in Israel, some uh, Palestinian patients getting their treatment from the Israeli doctors. Uh, and yes, you know, it was a good choice, you know, to, 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 to know or to understand the situation well. We invited hundreds of Palestinians and Israelis to host or to join one video call. Maybe in the first meeting, they will blame each other. They will, you know, <laughs> just the treating themselves. But in the second and in the third video meeting, for sure, they will ask about other things. The media promote for our com communities different pictures. Maybe the media promote for the Israelis and for the foreigner people that we are just here in Gaza dreaming all the all the night how we can kill an Israeli in the morning. And for sure, it's a fake idea. <laughs> it's not the truth. So, Skype with your enemy, it was a good idea to create our own media, away from any kind of agenda, away from any kind of interest. Just came from the people, people to people. And uh, last year, I think also I paid a very high price you know, for Skype with your enemy because they arrested me because of a meeting with more than 300 Israelis, you know, and all of this meeting, you know, resulted by a Skype with your enemy since six or seven years ago. So Rami, did you ever imagine that um, Skype with your enemy, uh, when you started that work, would land you in prison? Did you view it as that controversial when, when you all started it? Not that much, you know. <laughs> I realized that maybe I will face some risks, some challenges, maybe they will arrest me, but not for half a year. Especially that I am I know myself very well. I'm not an, a secret agent. I'm not a collaborator. I'm not a transferring any kind of information between any party. I know that I'm, 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 I'm working in a very sensitive, you know, space in, in this land, but it's, my, it's not my problem, you know, to be here. I just need my rights. I'm calling for my rights. Yeah. And, and founded my group to help the earth. The people here need, need each other. And the people here in Gaza need also to talk with the others. And, uh, and this kind you know, of love and courage came to me from the people, gave to me more power to continue. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Rami. But, no, I didn't expect that to <laughs> happen. Uh, I have I have a question from a colleague, Meg Hubeck. Meg, would you come in and, and ask your question? I would love to. Hi, Rami. It's good to see you, my son. Hi, mom. How are you? I'm so Here's well. My mom. Is this is my son? Not by birth, but by love. Um, and Rami, I have to tell you, when I opened up the New York Times and saw your your face in it. I was just overcome with emotion. So I want to ask you about that. So what was your reaction to the international response of your imprisonment? Um, do you think that the international response was a factor in your release? No, anymore. Okay. And I, I dare them, you know, to give me just one thing, you know, pro prove to me that my release, you know, happened because I have such a great friends and partners. 
like you and others who raised my boys. That this is what I, I was thinking about when I was in the gym, thinking okay. about my close friends. Uh, I met Meg, you know, since four years ago, and now we are still talking and, mm -hmm. and thinking and promoting our our ideas for the future. And until now, I disappointed a lot, you know, from, from the behaviors. But it's a message that this kind of, of international organization feeding a conflict, using the money just for some personal interest or for some project or proposals. And this kind of work will, will, will not be helpful, you know, for my relief. Uh, until now, I'm here. We're all of them. As a political administration, uh, they have their mutual interest. But it will be different if I'm not a Gazan, you know. If I'm, maybe I have another nationality, it, it will be maybe more helpful to them not to talk about. Skype with their enemy, also it's not an idea to connect Israeli and Palestinian. Also it's an idea to connect any kind of enemies. Yeah. Russian and Ukrainians, South, North Koreas, you know. It's like that. And I'm so proud, you know, to have a partner and a friend like me. Because I know, I know, I know me, how exactly she thought when she know that Rami arrested. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and for sure she wrote something. Him. For sure, she wrote something. For sure, she called someone. And you can you can imagine if you have 50 persons, you know, believing in you and supporting you, they will get you out of the jail. And mm -hmm. this is what happened. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rami, and thank you, Meg. Um, I, we now have to, to wrap things up, but I would love for each one of you to uh, basically, if you like, give a, a brief, maybe one minute comment. Rami, feel free to, to go ahead. Uh, first of all, I need to thank my partners, Polina, Joseph, uh, Wazma. I'm also very interested to have meetings also to know uh, my colleagues and all over the world and how we can build connection. And also, I'm uh, pleased, Polina, put me a partner in your uh, company, you know, travel and so. Yes, you can do yourself, you can do something. And uh, maybe I will arrive to America this year, and I hope maybe I can build any kind of initiatives together. Also, maybe to, to learn more about the experience of, of the women in Afghanistan and how we can build a, a generation of women here in Gaza can negotiate for their rights also in Myanmar, and, uh, I need this kind of ideas, how we can exchange our success stories. So thank you, Center for Politics, to let me know interested people like my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Rami. Joseph? Thanks, thanks for the opportunity, and, and, and it's been a pleasure to be with our final panelist. Uh, um, and congratulations for Center Politics for its achievement. Um, you know, as I said, you know, we all need to keep on working uh, uh, whatever we can do in order to um, achieve peace. I mean, it's not a global peace. It could be a peace in your neighborhood. Um, and as I said, you know, the, the conflict is natural, but violence is optional. So um, let's, let's work and, and help, help each of us to find common ground. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Paulina? Uh, yes, thank you for uh, I wanted to once again thank thank you for giving us the platform and got an opportunity to meet my fellow panelists and thank you for sharing your inspiring stories. I think uh, all of you are a great example of what the civilities really is. It's the fight against uh, dictatorship, anger and egoism. So um, I'm very honored to know you all. Um, and um, I hope that all of ideas will become true, even though a big part of the world can be against it. Thank you. Thanks for your perspectives, Paulina. Wajma. Yeah, uh, same. I would like to thank from you for providing us such a great opportunity to know about uh, our neighbors far or close, those who are surviving or those who 
suffering from same issues. I really uh, want to uh, point out what Joseph said that violation is optional option and nobody deserves violation. Nobody should be to, like survive or serve, face any, any kind of violence. So I believe, and I hope that we would have such a great events in future to know more about each other. Like these stories make me more inspired, more uh, motivated that there's so much still we have to fight for. And in these fights, we all should learn from each other. Well, thank you, Washma. And to each of you, thank you so much for, for coming together today. Thank you for your experiences and sharing them and, and all that you do. Hopefully one of these days, we will be able to see each other in person. Wouldn't that be nice? But to our, to our audience, thank you so much for joining us today. And please keep watch for uh, possible uh, further interviews with each, with each of the panelists. And also, uh, please join the Center for Politics Ambassador Series for events on March 30th with Her Excellency Alexandra Papadopoulou, Ambassador of Greece to the U.S., and on April 22nd, His Excellency Lazarus Kapambwe, Ambassador of Zambia to the United States. Farewell, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>